हेलो एंड वेलकम टू द नेक्स्ट एपिसोड ऑफ पॉलिसी वर्स आई एम रिति जॉइंट बाय माय कॉलीग प्रणय टुडे विल बी डिस्कसिंग एन इश्यू दैट इज़ वेल नोन बट परहैप्स नॉट एडिक्वेटली अंडरस्टूड एंड दैट इज द फंक्शनिंग ऑफ आर लेजिस्लेटर्स ऑफन ऑन आर टेलीविजन स्क्रीन्स वी सी लेजिस्लेटर्स रबल राउजिंग बिल्स गेटिंग पास विदाउट लेजिस्लेटिव ओवर साइड देर इज नो क्वालिटी डिबेट और डिस्कशन हैपनिंग इज इट दी इशू और इज इट अ सिम्टम ऑफ अ मच डीपर प्रॉब्लम टूडे टू डिस्कस ऑल ऑफ दिस वी हैव विद अस डॉक्टर जे पी वेलकम डॉक्टर जे पी थैंक यू रिति इट इज अ कॉमन अंडरस्टैंडिंग द लेजिस्लेटिव ब्रांच ऑफ द स्टेट फ्रॉम वेयर द एग्जीक्यूटिव इज ड्रॉन इज मोर पावरफुल इन ओवरसिंग द इम्प्लीमेंटेशन ऑफ पॉलिसीज कंट्रोलिंग द मिनिस्टर्स ensuring that the opinions of the electorate are adequately represented however what we see in india is that the legislature has become timid executive has become too strong and judiciary too arrogant what is your take on the utility of legislatures in the current setup priti legislature is vital for the simple reason that that's the only source of legitimacy to the whole governance process what is democracy that the will of the people is what governs it is a rule of the people either directly by themselves or through their elected representatives and the only body elected in the country or the only functionary elected in the country are the legislators therefore the question of legislature not being relevant does not arise because the moment you make legislature irrelevant there is no democracy but the problem is as you outlined we are using legislature only for the limited constitutional purpose that there must be a legislative election that the government will be drawn from the legislature with the majority support of the legislature and it collapses when the majority withdraws support to that very limited extent we understood the constitution therefore the whole politics is about how do i get a majority in the legislature either through the election process by persuading the people by bribing the people by Uh, emotionally arousing the people or by buying mlas by buying mps by all kinds of strategies to somehow manufacture a majority that is one part the second part how do i sustain the government or bring down the government ethical unethical right wrong national interest no it's irrelevant on both sides so unfortunately our democracy therefore is limited only to somehow getting the legislative majority and maintaining the legislative majority not about the purpose of democracy and about the content of democracy and that's why we see all these perversions and as you said rightly the body that creates the government that body that actually gives legitimacy to whole governance process is the body that is least relevant in ultimate governance in the country it's not a very good situation so you just mentioned that legislature's primary function is to legislate laws and the fact that it is very important is because it carries the will of the people the common understanding here is that the will of the people is carried by the ruling party but that is not the case fundamentally the will of the people is also carried by private members and for this first i'd like to draw a, a parallel between uk and india uk and india have a, had a common history and that is why the political setup of uk and india is somewhat similar but if you have to con- consider the private member bills in last 100 years where you see that 229 private member bills have been discussed debated and passed in uk the situation in india is very alarming and concerning in india out of 314 i think somewhere around only 14 bills have been discussed debated and passed that is merely 4% of the bills that have been introduced so why do you think that there is such a difference between the system of uk and us uh, uk and india despite the roots being similar there are two levels at which we should examine this to be fair even in the uk the parliament which is the mother of parliaments which creates the government has increasingly become less important in legislation unlike in other democracies take the united states the legislature owns legislation legislature owns the budget process at the state level or at the national or federal level and legislature is really in command and it is perhaps the first organ of state it is the most powerful branch of the state not the executive whereas in india and in the uk the executive is more powerful than the legislature first let's understand that right. as long as the executive commands the majority support in the legislature mm-hmm. that with them with that caveat once we have that majority support executive is always in command historically in british democracy in the westminster model 
the legislation proposal and its piloting has shifted from the legislature to the executive. As an allowance, private members are given space. It is taken seriously as opposed to India. Similarly, historically, the budget process, which ought to be a legislature's property, in fact, the whole fight between the king and the parliament was about control in terms of making laws and in terms of making the budget and expenditure. It has shifted to the government because, after all, government is derived from the legislature. It commands the majority in the legislature. Therefore, government is the one that proposes expenditure. Legislature merely discusses and votes on it, does not initiate. Again, contrary to American experience. In the US, the budget is the property of the legislature. And there is enormous negotiation, discussion, all kinds of work going on in the legislature. From there, it goes to the executive. The executive does propose uh, some elements, but ultimately, the legislature is the property. So, to be fair, the Westminster model that we have adopted, both in Britain and in India, and perhaps other countries which embrace the same model, the initiative has shifted from the legislature to executive. In India, it has gone in the extreme form. Because in Britain, there is respect for tradition and the fundamentals, the first principles of democracy. Therefore, the parliamentary supremacy is understood. And that's why you know you have the Prime Minister's question hour. Uh, very brief but very pointed questions are asked and very quick and effective responses. Uh, similarly, the private member's time. Third, any member, the, the, the member does not feel that her voice is silenced. And fourth, while parties say, give a whip and all that, there's no disqualification. You may quit the party. In fact, the only punishment that the party can impose on an erring member is removing the whip that basically saying you're not part of my legislature party. So giving them even more freedom. The only risk is electoral. Suppose the people don't like you switching from this party to being an independent, then they may vote you out. Or if they like your stand, they may vote you in. So there is party is not removing you from politics, unlike in India. Whereas in India, what happened? A, the anti-defection law. B, the undemocratic party organization. Parties controlled by individuals and families. There is no ownership of the party by the members. And C, the large constituencies in an illiterate country with highly centralized power. Large, illiterate, centralized. Together it is a deadly combination. Therefore, the candidate's merit is hardly any relevant, of any relevance. Whereas in Britain there are small constituencies, highly literate population. Though it is a unitary country, increasingly now it is a federal country. But even in unitary system, they have strong local governments. So with those things, the power of the party is not so oppressive that individual leaders' caliber is irrelevant. In India, it's increasingly irrelevant. Therefore, the members are desperate to please the party bosses. On top of it, you have the anti-defection law. A combination of all these means that individual members politically become irrelevant. If you deviate from the party's dictates, then they will not even nominate you in the next election. Without getting nominated by a party, getting the symbol of the party, you almost certainly have no political future. In the 1950s, when the party system was not so entrenched, though Congress was already a very strong party with roots, but still it was a loose kind of a system. About 50 plus members of the Lok Sabha, they were independents. And the Speaker Maulankar, though he was a congressman, acted in every sense of the time as an independent. Until the end of his political and personal life. Similarly, in states, large number of independents. Today, without a party, you almost have no political future. So it's a combination of all these. That's why FDR, the Foundation for Democratic Reforms, where we sit, has been instrumental in pushing or piloting significant legislative and even constitutional changes in the country. But we never depended on a private members' will because that is the death knell. The moment you ask a private member to propose something, that means it's guaranteed to fail. It's doomed to failure. Therefore, always we dealt with the key decision makers in government and in opposition and the key parliamentarians and others and persuaded them with the logic of it and the political argument why it should be taken up from their point of view. And in some cases we succeeded, in some cases we failed. But in India, an individual member independently taking it up without a major political party sponsoring it or owning it the chance of success is next to zero. So you just made a mention of G.V. Malwankar, the first speaker. And uh, there's another practice in UK that is the speaker of the house is appointed from non-ruling party. 
and that is no, uh, probably a generally not universally but informal times when margaret thatcher tried to deviate from the principle her own party senior leader edward heath former prime minister said no mm. we must give a chance to the opposition party and not only that the speaker once appointed as long as the speaker wants that is a position for uh, his political or her political life and the speaker is not any longer member of the party the speaker never goes back to a party if the speaker contests elections again contests as independent other parties do not put up a candidate is elected unanimously so they have form they none of it is by law there is a customs almost the with the status of law unfortunately even in the uk on occasion there is a breach of one or two of these principles and parties discipline is such that and sense of fairness is such that if somebody a member of let's say one party is not able to attend the parliament for um, no fault of hers you no know, sick stranded somewhere in a vital vote a member of the other party refrains from voting because parliamentary decisions are not about who is managing to come to the parliament who is running first it's about reason debate and your honest views so the arrangements that you've just cited that are pre prevalent in united kingdom why do you think that we have failed to institutionalize such arrangements in india because as i just mentioned that the history is common so for us everything was new why did we not institutionalize those kind of arrangements in india where it's did a, we go wrong it's a good question molankar acted exactly the way the speaker should act british practice and our leaders respected his role but perhaps they were also uncomfortable on occasion because you have a majority in the legislature but the speaker has become a stumbling block so it's possible that while they sort of tolerated it they were not particularly enamored by that second in britain it was not the rules and the laws it's the traditions sanctified over time britain does not even have a constitution it doesn't mean it has no have constitution there is no written constitution there is a supreme court which actually can hold a law invalid that means even though unwritten there is a code which is broadly accepted by the judiciary and by the political system and the country as inviolable that means it's almost like a constitution in india though the constitution is there what is not mentioned in the constitution we never bother to internalize that and and create traditions and rules uh, and therefore almost anything passes if it's not explicitly mentioned in the constitution then i don't have to worry about it often times i suspect even what is explicitly mentioned doesn't really matter take for instance some debates in some states article 176 says that the, the governor shall address the first session of the new assembly and thereafter every first session in the new calendar year well there are some states where the governors are not allowed to address by various stratagems it's not done it is clearly implied that an ordinance power is only meant for emergencies when the house is not in session but umpteen times you see what is happening in this country so only to the extent that it's absolutely vital for running politics namely getting the majority elected or manufacturing a majority by other means and sustaining a government or bringing down government and because without the parliament or the legislature you cannot formally enact a law you can only have ordinances up to a point not every hour if that's possible they would do that too and uh, only to the extent that budget has to be approved by the legislature otherwise i think we don't think democratic practice is important in this country and we are giving it the go by increasingly look at the number of days legislatures meet there are states where 15 days they meet 21 days in britain typically 150 days 200 days it's almost continuously in session because that is the organ that derives legitimacy from the people and therefore unless issues are public in the public domain debated honestly and in detail in a lucid manner where is democracy in our country because the constitution again says there shall not be a gap of more than 180 days between two sessions therefore the the legislature is meeting the executive is compelled to summon the legislature but only for that one day two days three days therefore the total duration of the legislature the sessions are only 10 12 15 days and those days also half the time is lost in shouting getting into the well and then walking out and things of that sort so we made it a notional democracy in many ways we reduce it to 
voting and shouting, not reasoned debate, not legislative supremacy, not reconciliation of conflicting interests, not looking at the long-term interests of the society even as you protect the short-term requirements. So it's become a quest for power without a purpose. That is at the heart of the crisis. Sir, I would like to pick two strands from your earlier answer. So I think I wouldn't be wrong if I say that the role of the legislator is merely saying yay and nay in the legislature, right? So, and on the other side, we also see that the quality of debate in the legislatures has diminished and you have rightly pointed that it is because the parties have to appease to the constituencies. So do you think that separation of powers as you know, it is practiced in the US is a way forward, keeping all else equal? I, I believe so, at the state level. I don't think it's worthwhile well at the national level because no, no system is perfect for any country. Every country is unhappy with the system it has chosen. For instance, in America, the federal legislature, the Congress, can almost never make a law unless both houses are also controlled by the president's party. Right now, the American lower house, House of Representatives, a slim Republican majority is there. And therefore, the president cannot get any legislation through. Even the upper house, they have strict rules, which they can change if they wish, but they're not changing it, of a majority of 60 to get anything through. So if you have a majority in the house, doesn't mean that you can get a law made. Now, what it means is there's a permanent paralysis in the federal government. Now, that apart, in India, the danger at the national level is, if a president is seen to be the symbol of the state, though there is no real power, American president, as we have seen, actually has much fewer powers than the president in Britain or India, because the prime minister in Britain or India, because the prime minister in our country's Westminster model enjoys the legislative majority automatically that is embedded in the system, and he or she is the head of the executive branch of government. Whereas in the US, is only the executive branch of government's head and he has no control over legislature. Oftentimes, legislature doesn't bother at all what the president wants. Therefore, they're paralyzed. So in reality, the power of a prime minister in our system is greater than that of the president. But the symbolic nature of the presidency, 21 gun salute, you are the commander in chief of the armed forces, you get all the state um, you know, functions recognition, because this is all descendants of monarchy, remember. It is so great that people feel terrified. If all executive power is concentrated in one president, even if he has no legislative or budgetary power, the fear is that he or she may play favorites in a very complex and diverse country, language, Hindi, non-Hindi, religion, Hindu, Muslim, the great divides of India, region, north, south. And therefore, my belief is at the national level, the balance of convenience lies in Persevering with the current model, but with improvements. But at the state level, we have no such problems. If we clearly separate the executive from legislature, there will be enormous improvement in the quality of elections, quality of leadership, the day-to-day -day interference in uh, administration. Because even if a chief minister wants to govern well, and there are chief ministers who, for their own political reasons, are genuine commitment to public good, they actually want to govern well. But within a few months, there is dissidence. From where? Within your party. Why? You are ignoring the party cadres. Because you are applying principles of rule of law equally. If you apply principles of rule of law equally, what's the point of us being in power? We worked, we sacrificed, we voted, we made other people vote. We got power. Now we must get the spoils of power. That is our notion of power in this country. Now, therefore, even a well-meaning government, or head of the government, cannot function fairly in public interest. Because legislators, if they are not appeased, the party cadres, if they are not appeased, the government actually will fall. So a separation of powers will certainly help. You can bring the fine talent from outside the legislature. One of the reasons why it's necessary is the legislator in India, at the state level in particular, but even at the national level, in their eyes or in the eyes of the public and the media, it's not merely the legislators, is no longer a legislator. Mm -hmm. uh, much of our discussion so far is based on the notion that a legislator is a legislator. In India, a legislator is disguised executive. Because we did not allow local governments to take roots at all. Constitution paid lip sympathy and directive principles. There is no third tier of government. 
once they came into existence and they were functioning somewhat well in some states and not very well in some other states, instead of encouraging that, we created a monster 73rd, 74th Amendment architecture, which overstructured and underpowered local governments. And even the good that is happening in some states is no longer possible because neither the states own it, nor is the structure conducive to good governance in the states. So right now, we have the weakest third tier of governments. So what happened? Day-to-day -day needs of people, a street lighting, water supply, the, the street in front of the house, the traffic management locally, or the sewerage, or stormwater drainage, a hundred other things, the people now expect legislator to somehow get them delivered. Now, legislator, what is his real power? He has no executive power. Therefore, you only use your nuisance value, your position every day. And therefore, a system, an ecosystem is now created in almost all states, irrespective of which party is governing, whereby a legislator is uncrowned king of his constituency. Transfers, postings, your uh, contracts and tenders, police cases, natural resources allocation, everything is entirely the MLA's preserve, particularly if she or he belongs to the ruling party, and to some extent even otherwise. Now that's why we are debating the role of legislature. Legislators are not debating the role, have you realized it? They are not asking for this role, this debate is not coming from legislatures. It's coming from us from a broader democratic point of view. Legislators see themselves as the de facto monarchs of the constituency. And they don't want local governments to come up even if some government is willing to allow them to take roots. So we have a very perverted system with all kinds of perverse incentives. And if, in order to correct that, it's not enough to simply have some rules in the legislature. We have to look at A, the systemic changes like can you separate executive and legislature at the state level? B, can we empower local governments in an effective but accountable manner? Just because you create local governments in the current uh, climate, let's not assume that the local government leaders will act in good faith in public interest. They will also abuse power. They will also buy the votes. They will also spend abnormal amounts of money. It's the logic of our politics today. Therefore, how do you safeguard the future against all those things? Uh, and how do you institute a system of rule of law, effective rule of law to prevent abuse of power so that public office is for public good? And once that incentive is gone, our behavior also alters. Look at Jessica Arden, the New Zealand Prime Minister. At the prime of her life, at the age of 42, after five and a half years of tenure, she gracefully said, I have no, no more fuel in the tank. I'm too exhausted as a person, as a human being, as a family member. Therefore, it's time for somebody else to take over leadership. Now, can you imagine that happening to a legislator, let alone to a prime minister or chief minister in India? Because we put so much store into the positions of power. We think that is our life at every level. If you are truly democratic, power is a responsibility. Power is a burden because instead of taking care of yourself, you are taking care of the society at enormous personal cost and family cost. In India, I don't think any person of the family feels that the person of the family is losing by power. In fact, they feel devastated when they lose power. They feel they have lost everything because power is everything. Power gives you money, power gives you privilege, power makes you corrupt. You can indulge in corruption as you please. Power gives you abuse of authority, power gives you the heirs. So it's a much larger question. We have to build institutions and mechanisms to slowly, we cannot reach that ideal overnight, but slowly the legislator does her job well, executive does its job well, local governments do their job well and the people are empowered, and ultimately power is for public service. I think we are very far from that idea. So yeah, there are three concerns that we'll be able to take care of if you know we switch over to separation of powers. But one of the things that I feel, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, that if the executive or if the leader of the state uh, draws its power from their popularity, wouldn't it lead to more schisms in the polity, which is already too fractious? As we discussed uh, with the no system is perfect. But let's see what is happening. To look at what might happen, we must understand first what is happening. Are we in any serious doubt that Jailalitha in Tamil Nadu or Stalin today, KCR in, in Telangana or 
వైఎస్ జగన్ చంద్రబాబు నాయుడు అని అంటారు ఆర్ ప్రాక్టికలీ ఎన్ని లీడర్ ఇన్ ఎనీ స్టేట్ ఆర్ వీ ఎనీ డౌట్ దట్ దే ఆర్ డిక్టేటర్స్ ఇన్ దేర్ రెస్పెక్టివ్ స్టేట్స్ దే వర్డ్ ఈస్ లాంగ్ సో ఇట్స్ నాట్ దట్ అవర్ కరెంట్ సిస్టమ్ ఈస్ క్రియేటింగ్ మోర్ హంబుల్ లీడర్స్ ఆర్ క్రియేటింగ్ జెన్యువన్ చెక్స్ అండ్ బ్యాలెన్సెస్ ఇన్ ఎక్సర్సైజ్ ఆఫ్ పవర్ ఫస్ట్ లెట్స్ అండర్స్టాండ్ దట్ వెన్ వీ క్రిటిక్ సంథింగ్ అండ్ ఆంటిసిపేట్ సమ్ డేంజర్స్ ఫస్ట్ వేర్ ఆర్ వీ ఆర్ వీ డూయింగ్ వెల్ ఈస్ దిస్ గోయింగ్ టు బి అండర్ మైండ్ ఫస్ట్ ఆఫ్ ఆల్ దే ఫోర్ దట్స్ దట్స్ నాట్ ఎ అప్రోప్రియేట్ క్రిటిక్ ద సెకండ్ ఈజ్ యాజ్ వీ డిస్కస్ బిఫోర్ ఎన్ ఎలెక్టెడ్ గవర్నర్ ఆఫ్ ఎ స్టేట్ డైరెక్ట్లీ ఎలెక్టెడ్ గవర్నర్ ఆఫ్ ఎ స్టేట్ ఎక్సర్సైజింగ్ ఎగ్జిక్యూటివ్ ఫంక్షన్స్ but having no automatic control over legislature is weaker than the existing scheme of things the prime minister or chief minister controlling a majority in parliament and therefore be assured of legislature always being with her and anyway controlling the executive therefore to think that if executive is separately elected somehow it will be more tyrannical less accountable is not entirely true third the jealousy that's what the whole separation of powers doctrine is about no organ of state wants another organ to be all powerful if you can possibly do something about it what is happening with the judiciary and the executive in the country today or in the united states they're fighting right some of it is healthy some of it is unhealthy but basically it's about who is superior if the same framework is available to legislature that the government doesn't come from legislature then they will also tend to actually fight a little bit but it will not be so great that it will paralyze because in our country the general tendency is to go towards the executive go towards who is wielding the executive power that is the normal tendency therefore i don't expect a schism between executive and legislature but i certainly i think some amount of friction between the two is desirable is healthy for the country but for this to work if the head of the executive branch is also a party leader and a party leader is supreme there is dictatorship within the party that's not going to help therefore internal democracy within the parties and removal of this anti defection law these are two critical requirements for this system to work then you know if the choice of candidates is by genuine democratic methods members choice or the elected delegates choice then there is a proper political recruitment and if they are free to exercise their will about legislation and about budget their voice is heard with respect and attention then they will assert themselves and the executive will be under check and finally we must create a strong system of local governments in fact not only is it necessary for a for a strong uh, and effective uh, separation of powers effective separation of powers makes it easier because right now because mla support is critical for the government survival you are not able to build strong local governments against the mla's will the moment you create local governments mla will say why am i here i am spending so much money because mla is not looking at legislation and budget as his real powers or responsibilities he is not looking at holding the government account as a responsibility he is looking at local exercise of power as his responsibility so you also separate that because that becomes easier and mla cannot bring down a government now mla can bring down a government therefore no government will is there into violate the wishes of the mla so the system today is perverted those incentives must be realtered and we must clean up the system but with accountability to ensure that overall efficacy is there because you must not throw the baby with the bath water i um, agree with what you just said about you know that going about with legislations with private member bill is not the way forward because more or less it will be put down it Absolutely. probably won't you know go through yeah it will be buried but no, no, i have no doubt that in india if you go through that route nothing happens yeah but see efficiency of legislature is not just about how many laws have been passed it's also about the number of laws or policies that have been discussed and debated so with that i have certain you know a uh, number i'd like to talk about in uh, uk uh, 13 fridays are chosen in an year wherein f- on an average 5 hours of time is given to discussion on private members bill whereas if that number has to be compared with india i think the maximum time that was allotted to for the discussion of private members bill was 
between 2004 to 9 and that was 65 62 years spread over five years whereas in uk it is 65 years on an average every year so leave about you know passing of the bills it is also about the discussion and debate why do you think that we do not have that healthy discussion of bills you know sponsored by private members they are seen like you know second grade legislators why do you think that is the case no, your point is right but you must put it in the context when the legislature itself became irrelevant in the scheme of things in popular imagination and in actual governmental functioning a private member's mill, which is a subset of that, is obviously a casualty. Therefore, we must now enhance the power of the legislator individually and legislature collectively. That means a series of things. One, the practices within the legislature giving private members adequate space and time to ventilate their views. It may be views about a certain issue emerging in the country, it may be about a bill, it may be about something else. And on occasions, on rare occasions, when we gave that opportunity, our legislatures actually function pretty well. I recall vividly in the last 15-20 years, two bills on which there was real debate in Parliament. One was the GST, uh, Constitutional Amendment, the other was the Lokpal Bill. I followed both of them very carefully. I'm sure many of our countrymen and women have followed them carefully. They were really rich debates, bringing out all the nuances and the complexity of the issue and trying to reconcile conflicting interests. But because in 15, 20 years, these are the only two, we have to especially mention them. That should be the norm in every bill. Therefore, there is no question about it, parliamentary practice. But also removing the, the whip and the control of the party, because even if you allow a debate now in this country, with the whip and therefore your ability to say anything contrary to the government's view or your party boss's view, irrespective of facts and logic, if it's not there, then you are wasting time. Therefore, you must remove that. And the third is, in India increasingly, the parliament and legislatures are not about debate and discussion. They're about how much of a noise you create, how much of interruption and disruption you have created, how many times you go into the well, how much you shout and walk out. Now, this is heinous. This is entirely in the hands of the legislature, as long as the party leaders, they are willing to cooperate right now, Everybody pays lip sympathy, but the party leaders want this to continue because that is how they control the whole process and the party. And finally, even if you do all these things, we will not really have uh, improved functioning. Therefore, we have to look at political recruitment. How do we bring in the right kind of people through an electoral system that rewards competence, public spiritedness and uh, integrity? Right now, I don't think we can claim that because it's money power, it's the caste power, it is the patronage of a political leader uh, that gives you the advantage, but not your qualities as a leader. Therefore, the electoral system that you have and the political recruitment model that you have. So, it's, unquestionably, within the legislature, there must be reforms, but there must be also reforms in the overall political culture without which this will have only partial impact. So you just mentioned that legislators make a lot of noise. There's a quote that says, you know, uh, I like the noise of democracy. Do you think that our legislators have taken it way too seriously? <laughs> it's cacophony instead of real voice. Uh, but you know, there's another way we can do it. And in some respects at the parliamentary level, not adequately, but it's working a little better. Committee system. Right. Committee system. For instance, uh, Woodrow Wilson, as the president during the First World War time, he said, Congress in session is Congress an exhibition. He was talking about the U.S. Congress. You know, as you know, the both houses of the parliament, they would not, they would, they call it Congress in the U.S., the elected houses of the federal legislature. In session is Congress an exhibition. Congress in committees is Congress at work. Mm. Always this exhibition part is about grandstanding about getting media attention, about taking an extreme position so that people take note of you. If you make a reasoned, calm, uh, dispassionate speech based on logic and evidence, people get bored, they switch off. If you shout from rooftops, take an extreme position, Hindu, Muslim, or caste system, or parties, or something else, then you are noticed. Unfortunately, it's also the media and our own citizenship or personal attention. You see what's happening in the media or say the legislatures. The more extreme and silly you are, the more noticeable you are. The more balanced and calm you are, the less noticeable you are. So because of these temptations, in the session world over, 
the quality is a little less than it is in the committees. But in other countries, because they have very strict rules about using that time and disciplining the members of the Congress who are arraying, at least the conduct is civil, even if the quality is sometimes a little indifferent. But in committees, it's a little non-partisan, unhurried deliberation is possible, and the real discussion, going into the nuances and the depths of the issues, will more often happen in committees. Our committees are extremely weak. In parliament, they're a little better, but even there, they're not really strong. Ultimately, it's the government's choice what to do. Committees can just advise. Whereas in the US, for instance, the committees are all powerful. Uh, we have to create committee system. In the states, in most states, committees, they virtually are non-existent. Perfunctorily on paper, they exist, but they're inconsequential. I totally agree with you with regards to the importance of committees. You know, I, and also not just the committees in India are weak, but also, you know, they're not sufficient. They're not enough. And there's one <clears throat> data I was going through that uh, from 2014 to 19, the number of laws that were, you know, the bills per se were referred to the committees were nearly 25 percent. Whereas right now in this current Lok Sabha, that is 2019 to 24, the bill, the percentages of the bills that have to be referred to the committees has gone down to even 20 percent. So. Do you, do you, don't you see the situation to be very alarming? No, I would not say alarming, but definitely unhealthy. After all, ultimately, the legislature is elected by the people. You command a majority in the legislature. Therefore, theoretically, you cannot question the legitimacy of a law made by the whole legislature. But the quality of debate is very disturbing. There's no question about it. No, but you must not always go by the percentages. Because a large number of legislations are technical in nature. It is about one provision, some amendment because you found some difficulties at a point of time or new challenges emerging. Uh, therefore, more than the, the percentage and numbers, I would like to go into the nature of legislation. If it's a real legislation, a new law being made or proposed, then unless there's an imminent threat to the country, there's an emergency, you cannot delay, you cannot wait. I think ideally it should be deliberated properly in the committee. And in India, while a significant number, 20-25 percent are sent, uh, it certainly is not a majority. And there are some significant legislations that are not put through the legislature, even good legislations. The farm laws are a good example. If the farm laws, which are well intended, they're good laws, they're not sufficient, but they're necessary to liberate the agricultural markets from the clutches of the government and control Raj and license Raj, they're vital. If only they were debated and discussed in the committees, and if the minor uh, disagreements are there if you have uh, created a process of reconciliation and some kind of a reasonable compromise without really undermining the purpose of the laws, India would have been better served. But by pushing them through the legislature without the committee system, the country lost. So I think even from a broader point of, of acceptability of legislation, it's in the interest of the people and the government to go through the committee system. Hurried thing is not a very good thing. You know, even however impatient you are to to have a baby delivered, unless the baby actually grows in the womb for 280 days, if you pull the baby forcefully, oftentimes the mother and baby will be in danger. Legislation also is like that. You must give it a natural time and a process and be a little patient unless there's an imminent threat, unless there's an emergency.